Hey everyone, this is Mr. David. This is going to be uh, really the last kind of major content lesson uh, where we look at the post-Cold War world. And this is going to span uh, from 1992 to basically present day. Um, you might say to yourself, wow, that seems like a lot of information to be cramming into one session. Well, that's somewhat true, but at the same time, if you really think about what history is, uh, it's about not only kind of learning about the past, but reflecting on it and really being able to see how the past played out so we can better kind of understand it. So the reality is when we talk about things from even 10 years ago, it's really hard to understand kind of the big magnitude um, of those events and why exactly they're significant and other types of things like that. So I think that's really important to kind of consider and remember as we go through this. Um, and it's, you know, again, there's some stuff that we can say some things about, but especially um, more current things, it's really hard. It's kind of challenging. Um, even when we talk about these presidents and kind of their roles and kind of their ratings throughout history, it's really hard because at the end of the day, a lot of their policies, we don't exactly know um, kind of the full plan out or what exactly happened through them because we're going to wait to see that. Um, so that's why we just don't spend too much time through this, but still obviously some significant things and still some things that we can talk about. And when we get to kind of a few years from now, we'll definitely be able to make some uh, more kind of pronounced and more kind of thought out uh, considerations, conclusions, etc. So I'll start this from where we took off last time and then I'll move into kind of all the way into the present. But again, going with what I just said earlier, not spending too much time on the present. So I'll start uh, right off the bat with where we left off in the last lesson, uh, which is going to be the um, presidency of George H.W. Bush. Well, good thing happens for H.W. Bush. This really happens during Reagan, but it kind of officially plays out. When the Cold War ends, the Soviet Union dissolves and the U.S. remains as the sole superpower of the world. Really great stuff. But also remember that by the time we hit 1992, a bad economy has hit into the United States. George H.W. forced to raise taxes, something he promised on the campaign trail not to do. Um, so kind of led to some unpopularity for him. Also, by 1992, this kind of really, really strict conservatism that Reagan had done and now H.W. had kind of continued, a lot of Americans were saying, hey, listen, we don't want like New Deal type stuff, but maybe this is a little too much. And so the Democrats are going to kind of try to take that momentum and they're going to put up for president a Democrat, the governor of Arkansas, his name, uh, William or Bill Clinton. And Bill Clinton, a Democrat, but he branded himself as a new Democrat. And what he meant by this was that he wanted to be much more centrist than his previous uh, Democratic presidents. So, for example, um, you know, economic growth, um, anti-crime, things like that. Um, and, you know, definitely social policies. I mean, that's obviously, you know, Democratic foundations, but nothing too crazy, um, and more so just trying to kind of get things uh, together, uh, you know, kind of some government intervention, some government help, as opposed to kind of Reagan and HW, which is basically kind of keep the government out of everything. The Republicans obviously are going to go with their incumbent, George HW Bush, who, you know, had it wasn't like he was totally unpopular, but he definitely wasn't quite there. Um, also, Bill Clinton, 1992, kind of a lot of energy, a lot of enthusiasm on the campaign trail. Um, and really, even though H.W. Bush was definitely able to claim victory for foreign policy things, like ending the Cold War and the first Gulf War, the reality is the economic stuff uh, really is going to be what's going to push him down. And in 1992, Clinton will achieve victory. Um, not a huge, like, resounding victory. This is not going to be like Reagan in 1984, but big enough to show that this is kind of what the American people wanted. Um, Clinton will also get Democratic majorities in both houses of Congress in 1992, which meant that he really felt he'd be able to kind of pursue his policies 
pursue what he kind of wanted to do uh, with both houses of Congress there to support him. Here's Bill Clinton, by the way, in some of his younger days. Here's a look, by the way, at the um, electoral map. The other significant thing about the election in 1992 is it's a really impressive showing for a third-party candidate. Uh, this is the independent Ross Perot, the Texas uh, billionaire who campaigned and was able to actually attract, as you can see here, nearly 20% of the popular vote. Of course, in the Electoral College system, that does not translate into um, Electoral College votes, but uh, still a pretty significant showing, biggest kind of third-party showing since uh, Teddy Roosevelt and his Bull Moose campaign in 1912. So uh, Ross Perot uh, getting quite a good amount of votes. And here, by the way, is Bill, and this is um, him announcing victory, and then this is his vice president, who is Al Gore. Um, and Al Gore kind of makes a name for himself, yeah, as vice president, but because of some other things that happened with him um, after this in 2000 and then what he does uh, post that. So definitely someone we'll be talking about in just a little bit. So let's talk about the early Clinton presidency, what's going to kind of happen. And Clinton kind of comes out and says, hey, look, you know, I got both houses of Congress. They're Democrats. So let's get things together. So he decides to try to push for a policy ending the ban on gay and lesbian uh, soldiers in the armed forces. Well, this is going to be a little too much for people who still in 19... Uh, 93 were worried about what that might mean, um, having gay and lesbian soldiers in the armed forces. And so instead, he'll develop kind of a medium policy, which is known as don't ask, don't tell. This is basically where gay and lesbian soldiers were accepted into the military, but much more quietly, and they did not acknowledge their orientation openly. So kind of a strange policy, and not really that big reform that Clinton had kind of pledged. So yeah, it's somewhat problematic here. Another thing that Clinton said he wanted to do on the campaign trail was he wanted to reform health care. And definitely in 1993, health care in the United States was expensive. There were a lot of people that didn't get coverage because of pre-existing conditions, making kind of a situation occur where many Americans did not have health care. And that led to a lot of problems because um, without health care, they couldn't get checkups and things like that. And then by the time they got in the hospital, they were planted with a, you know, thousands and thousands of dollar bill. And so all of a sudden, you know, Bill Clinton says, hey, I'm going to reform the system, uh, make it so that it's much easier to access health care. It's there uh, for you. It's it, it, it makes sense. It works, etc." He's going to appoint his wife, which is kind of an interesting move, to be the director of the task force to redesign the health uh, care industry. And she and the task force will come up with a program uh, for fixing health care. And this will just completely fail when it comes to uh, Congress. Um, Hillary definitely got blamed for these failures, um, for the inadequacies of the proposed plan. Um, so not really a great start to the Clinton presidency. Um, he did have more success, though, with being able to shrink the uh, federal deficit to really low levels. Clinton, though, is going to be assisted by this because of the fact that um, he's taking on after the Cold War, which means big spending, like with the arms race, he didn't necessarily have to deal with or anything like that. So that definitely helped Clinton. Uh, be able to shrink the federal deficit, but there's some other things he does as well. It's also important to realize that anti-government sentiment did not necessarily go away with Clinton. Uh, that was still definitely there, and probably the best example of that was a bombing that occurred in Oklahoma City in 1995 that took 168 lives, and these were basically paramilitary militias who operated secretively underground, um, had huge amount of weapons, very suspicious of government, and in this kind of extreme case, uh, this really, you know, this was the bombing of a federal building uh, showing kind of the extent um, of the extreme of anti-governmentism that still was around in the 1990s. Um, so obviously that's an extreme example of anti-government feelings, but still people, because of Watergate, because of Vietnam, um, not incredibly confident of the government, 
Um, long way, by the way, since, you know, kind of the New Deal and World War II, where people were very satisfied and very confident in government. And uh, now we're in the 1990s, people not really having that feeling anymore. A big thing that's going to happen in the 90s in several states, it will not quite happen on the federal government scale, is that states will implement term limits for elected officials. And this is kind of designed as a way to make sure people don't get too comfortable in government and that there's kind of a healthy flow and healthy kind of change uh, going on. And here we see Hillary as she tried to pitch the health care bill that did not become reality in 1993. We'll move ourselves now into what kind of happens and what will dominate uh, a lot of Clinton's presidency, which is a divide between himself and Congress. And that's because in 1994, uh, conservatives were able to win uh, over Congress. And this is going to lead to a pretty serious kind of tension and struggle between President Clinton and the Republican Congress. This Republican Congress can be led by this gentleman you see here who was from Georgia, his name Newt Gingrich, and he basically really kind of attacked Clinton in a lot of big Democrat and liberal policies. One of the big things um, that they're going to do is a uh, welfare reform bill this put deep cuts into many significant social programs. Also required people on welfare to find jobs so you can just collect welfare for a long period of time. Uh, definitely conservative victory, but not something necessarily Clinton essentially maybe wanted. It's going to be really tense between Clinton and the Re Republicans, 1995, 1996, with all this going on. So significant that the federal government will actually shut down for several days in 1995 over a budget crisis and the inability of the two sides to come to agreement there. And this is something we've actually seen happen semi-recently in the 2000s. Uh, but, you know, pretty rare and definitely showing um, an inability of really Democrats and Republicans to get along. And that's definitely what we see here in 1995 with the federal government shutdown. This shutdown, this tension between Republicans and Clinton as president is actually going to help Clinton gain some more support um, from some people that thought that Gingrich and the Republicans were kind of being too harsh on him and, and kind of giving him too much of a hard time, and that will work to Clinton's benefit as he is able to achieve victory in 1996 uh, for a second uh, term. And here we see, by the way, the uh, look here. Um, again, pretty good victory here for Clinton, um, showing still continued kind of support and people wanting to continue uh, with Clinton and his policies. So let's talk about some significant things that happened in Clinton's second term from 1997 to 2001 or 1996 to 2000 if you're counting election years. Um, one of Clinton's probably biggest strength is going to be budgetary types things. And even though some tax reductions were put into place, he was able to balance the budget for the first time in over 30 years. Um, so definitely some credit there, uh, which is really, really good. Affirmative action, we kind of talked about this back and forth. Um, he's going to take kind of a middle ground here on affirmative action. Some state decisions are going to come up that are going to lessen affirmative action in select states. And Clinton will kind of criticize these decisions, but will not go as far as actually overturning them or trying to reverse them. It's kind of showing a middle ground here that Clinton's trying to do here, um, kind of keep supporters at bay. Economic growth, again, big big strength. That's really where we see Clinton get kind of his highest marks. Uh, really big growth uh, that that's achieved through the economy. So a couple reasons for this being the case. Again, because there's no real war that's being fought, fought that always helps money-wise. But another thing that helps is that Clinton will have the federal government really sponsoring low interest rates. This is going to allow a lot of people to borrow money relatively easily. We'll see home ownership go up. And then the other thing that's happening is uh, it's during Clinton's presidency where we see that real big boom of what's referred to as the dot-com 
industry, which is just like the internet. But um, at the time, a uh, new thing and all of a sudden explodes. A lot of new jobs, a lot of new wealth coming together. So Clinton's lucky enough to be president as all that is going on. That's really going to help him. Trade-wise, Clinton's going to sign what's known as NAFTA, the uh, North American Free Trade Agreement. This is a creation of a free trade zone between the U.S., Canada, and Mexico. Uh, the idea being, you know, since they were all in North America, might as well have this situation where they're able to trade relatively easily between um, all three countries. Well, the problem for some is that there's going to be some... Uh, kind of resentment in the United States over the fear of a loss of jobs in the U.S. Uh, with cheap labor from Mexico uh, through this. So um, some, you know, a little critical saying this is bad for workers, but others saying, wow, look at the expansion of trade that's going to happen uh, between these three countries because of NAFTA. So here, by the way, is Clinton signing NAFTA into law. And then here we see the other side of NAFTA, which are people protesting um, over, and it's really going to be labor unions, uh, seeing NAFTA as being unfair for American workers. This, by the way, is the um, growth rate that occurs during the Clinton presidency, and then after uh, 2000 would be the George W. Bush presidency, then into Obama. But you can see here pretty substantial and good growth rates that occur uh, consistently throughout Clinton's presidency. So that's really where Clinton always gets his high marks. Um, where Clinton's track record does not necessarily get always the highest mark would probably be uh, what happens abroad, where it's, his track record is going to be a little bit more mixed. And that has a lot to do with the fact that Clinton takes over when anti-communism has now left and the Soviet Union's not really a threat anymore. So it kind of becomes this question, what should be the focus of American foreign policy? Because had anti-communism, you know, that was what it was for, you know, 40 plus years. But with that threat not exactly being there anymore, what exactly was going to be the next kind of deal going on? And so the answer for Clinton is going to be kind of a mix between kind of being a peacekeeper throughout the world, but not necessarily involving uh, the United States and everything going on. So probably the best example of the latter of that would be Something that happens kind of early in Clinton's presidency, which is the Rwandan genocide. And in the Rwandan genocide, literally have a genocide going on in Rwanda. And the United States will basically stay on the sidelines and not intervene. And even to this day, uh, that decision has received criticism because of the massive loss of lives that occurred in Rwanda um, and the idea that U.S. intervention could have helped save lives and ended the conflict earlier. But Clinton decides to stay out in 1994. China is going to be a tricky one as well. Uh, Clinton will improve trade relations with China. But as China continues their kind of poor record of human rights and they continue human rights abuses, we will largely not hear much from the United States. And this, by the way, has been kind of a big problem uh, for a lot of U.S. presidents because of the economic importance of China. This idea that really try not to offend them or anything like that. So it's unfortunate, uh, but that's kind of what's developed um, in large part throughout uh, the more modern history of the United States. There's going to be uh, some trouble down in the Balkans region, uh, where an ethnic cleansing genocide is going to take place in Kosovo. Uh, in this situation, the U.S. will actually lead um, some NATO forces in order to stop it. So it's kind of interesting. He comes in at, in Kosovo, but does not necessarily come in in Rwanda. So kind of something interesting to um, consider there as well. Um, Middle East is going to be a tricky situation. He's going to preside over some Israel-Palestinian meetings, but not really going to come together on an anticipated deal. Um, that is going to be still a big problem and big issue for really all American presidents. Um, and there's going to be some flare-ups in the Middle East where the response is going to be a little uh, light here probably. Uh, probably the most significant foreign achievement that 
Clinton does help broker is going to be the Good Friday Agreement with uh, Ireland in regards to Northern Ireland and um, the United Kingdom. Uh, this is kind of a long story, but I'll try to make it as quick as possible. When Ireland gained their independence, there was a section that was primarily British in the 1920s. And so this area became known as Northern Ireland. And throughout the 1900s, especially in the 60s and 70s, uh, Irish nationalists would basically bomb uh, police and set fires, other terrorist type things, because they wanted Northern Ireland to become part of one big Ireland. And this agreement was luckily hashed out, um, which basically continued the independence of Northern Ireland, but kind of still maintain close bonds with Northern Ireland and Ireland. Um, so even though Northern Ireland being a part of the United Kingdom, it wasn't necessarily as um, separated as it was before. So actually this agreement has led to a lot of success and peace in the region. And this is actually Clinton with uh, Jerry Adams, who was uh, one of the big um, Irish people um, in on the Good Friday Agreement. So this was a big success in 1998. Okay, what most people remember Clinton for is a pretty bizarre and uh, just bad scandal that's going to develop his presidency. So, first off, uh, a lot of scandal, really, even from the beginning. There was a real estate development deal that seemed to have gone wrong when um, Clinton was the governor of Arkansas that was called Whitewater. And really, since Clinton was president there was a special investigation being done into Whitewater. Now, Clinton never has been formally indicted or formally charged with anything in regards to that. But as they were investigating this and looking at other things, um, it came out that he had had a sexual affair with a young White House intern, um, this young lady here named Monica Lewinsky. Okay, that's bad within and of itself. Okay, this is a married man. This is the president. We don't want that type of behavior. But the other situation is that he had technically lied under oath about the affair. Um, he was being questioned about something else. Um, he denied this. And so many said that this doesn't seem good. So a special investigator that was uh, named Ken Starr, who was investigating Whitewater, also began investigating the Lewinsky situation, and he wrote up a report that basically gave separate grounds for Clinton to be impeached. And really what it came down to was not necessarily the affair itself, but the fact that he had lied about the affair under oath. So House Republicans brought up charges for impeachment, um, perjury, and also obstruction of justice. And remember how impeachment goes, and you might forget because we rarely ever see it. Impeachment starts in the House, and they basically bring the charges. And then if that happens, then it goes to the Senate, and the Senate confirms the charges. So technically it's the Senate that actually, whose decision would actually lead to removal in office. So the House will actually confer, will, will push forth the charges but in the Senate, in a largely partisan vote, there will not be enough to impeach, and Clinton will remain president, and impeachment will be avoided. Um, still, obviously, a messy situation. Um, still, obviously, um, not good behavior. The president's going to be on TV defending himself a lot about what happened. Um, messy deal entirely. So this, by the way, was a picture taken of Monica Lewinsky when she was a White House intern and had met Bill Clinton. So this is like an official White House picture. And here, by the way, is some of the headlines from when it actually went through um, on December of 1998 with the House. And here's your next one that occurred about two months later in February of 1999 where Clinton was acquitted by the Senate, uh, not really even very close to the two-thirds majority needed. So let's talk about the situation post-impeachment and what's going to kind of happen again towards the end of Clinton's presidency. Well, 
people it's interesting are a lot more willing to forgive you if your economy is doing well and they got money in their pockets and the reality is under Clinton's presidency that does happen so people are relatively forgiving there's also a lot of people that are saying yeah you know that was kind of messed up but not really necessarily an impeach impeachable offense that shouldn't exactly be the case and so that's going to be kind of a large uh, thing that's going to be heard throughout this even though he came in, um, you know, he, when he came in, he was a new Democrat, did not really seem huge, major reforms, um, does more probably to um, consolidate a lot of the conservative plans of Reagan and H.W. Bush, then really reverse them. Um, obviously, the health care was a big reform attempt, didn't happen, so is what is. But because of the budget surplus, because of his popularity, the Democrats will decide to put up his vice president, who is this guy that you see here on the right side of this picture, who is Al Gore. So the idea here is, hey, kind of like almost Reagan or something like that with H.W. Bush. Times are going well. You know, this is all good stuff. Let's put this guy up for re-election, or put this guy up for election with the idea that a lot of this will kind of continue on what Clinton has started, and that should lead to some popularity. The Republicans are going to put up George W. Bush, the son of the previous president, George H. W. Bush, who was a gov who was the governor from Texas. And what we're going to see is really the clo well, pretty much the closest election in um, history. And what will happen is basically the country will almost split evenly. And so there's going to be one state that's going to basically decide the victor, which is going to be the state of Florida. So in a really bizarre situation, the TV and the report start saying, hey, Bush won. Um, and so that was kind of thought, okay, that's fine. But then Gore's team is going to say, no, it's too close. Okay, we want the votes recounted other things like that and this will lead to this political standoff over how really to count the votes in Florida. Um, the Democrats will ask for a recount in several Florida counties. The Republicans will say no, back and forth, back and forth, and this will end up being settled by the Supreme Court who will say no recount um, and that will lead Bush to technically achieve the victory. Now, with that being said, although Bush technically wins, this whole situation is going to cast some illegitimacy over his presidency right off the bat, especially because Gore will actually win the popular vote, um, even though Bush wins the electoral vote and thus wins the election. So here we see this um, in 2000. It's really interesting to see how things have shifted, which is that um, in 2000, Republicans picking up a lot of states, but the Democrats picking up so many electoral votes because of the um, big states that they pick up. And, um, you know, again, really kind of interesting to see where they're getting. And you can see how close this was in the electoral, 271 to 266. I mean, it doesn't really get a whole lot closer than that. And then you can see the popular vote, actually Gore wins, um, by, you know, a few million votes. So this will cost and cast some illegitimacy over this. And here, by the way, is some of the newspaper headlines. Uh, some of them kind of poking fun at the whole situation, but um, really just a, a bizarre situation that developed. Okay, so let's talk about some things that are going to happen during the Bush presidency. So... As Republican governor of Texas, Bush got a lot of credit for working well with the Democratic majority in the state's legislature. So the idea was he would bring some level of coordination uh, and, and uniting, basically, when he came to the White House. The reality is that's not really going to be the case. Uh, Bush is going to do a lot of things that are going to be more divisive than really uniting. So that's kind of interesting. Some examples of that is that um, Bush really sees himself as being a very conservative president, so he's going to withdraw support for international health pro programs uh, that sanction abortion. He's also going to cut government spending 
on stem cell research, so both of these kind of alienating for the more liberal um, and democratic voters in the country. He's also going to uh, pick a vice president who is a very much uh, insider by the name of Dick Cheney, and he's going to allow um, Cheney to kind of be in charge of uh, brokering out some energy policies and some energy deals. The problem is a lot of these are done behind closed doors um, between Cheney and some representatives of some big oil companies. So kind of seen as being secretive, not necessarily for the best of the American people. What exactly was Cheney up to? You know, stuff like that. Um, Bush will implement huge tax cuts in his presidency. Um, he thought that would be really great. And as a conservative, he wanted to pitch that. Um, later on, though, these tax cuts will be responsible for massive deficits as literally the uh, country is just not taking in enough money. And here, by the way, is another criticism of the Bush tax cuts, which is what we saw with Reagan as well, which was that these were things that benefited the rich more than uh, anyone really else. And actually, according to this, it helps the people that are rich and then really doesn't help the people below. And then here's Bush and Dick Cheney. Many have criticized and have said that Cheney was really the mastermind kind of pulling the strings behind the Bush presidency. Again, we, we really not exactly sure if that's the case, but definitely Cheney had quite a little bit of power in his own right as vice president, much more so than typical vice presidents. Bush's presidency is going to be rocked pretty quick by a significant event that's going to happen on September 11, 2001, which is going to emphasize the end of U.S. invincibility, the end of kind of U.S. we'll never be attacked on our own soil, we're, we're, we're totally protected, we're totally safe, etc. And that's not going to be the case at all when four planes are successfully hijacked by Islamic militants as part of a terrorist group. Two of those planes will crash into the World Trade Center. The World Trade Center will totally um, crumble and dissolve later that day. One will go into the Pentagon, causing significant damage. And then the other one is going to crash in a Pennsylvania farm. This was uh, Flight 93. And Flight 93 was the last one. And so when the hijackers took over the plane... Um, they started calling family members and loved ones to tell them what had happened. And the family members and loved ones told them, hey, there's been three other planes that have been hijacked. They've crashed in the World Trade Center, you know, whatever. And so they actually rushed the hijackers, forcing the plane to crash um, in the middle of Pennsylvania on some random farm. They all died, but in doing so, they made a tremendous sacrifice. So we always um, are appreciative uh, for the great sacrifice made by the um, members of Flight 93. In total, about 3,000 people will be killed in 9-11. This includes, obviously, all the people on the planes themselves, but also many people who become trapped in the buildings. The biggest attack on U.S. soil. Um, so this is obviously a huge travesty. These are also all innocent lives, obviously, so really, really sad. Um, Bush will actually respond in a relatively big way. And, he, you know, this situation where he's going to claim respect for the Islamic religion as a whole, but will be clear that this was an orchestrated attack by this militant extremist Islamic group, which was Al-Qaeda. And it was orchestrated by their leader, a guy by the name of Osama bin Laden. And Osama bin Laden was originally from uh, Saudi Arabia, uh, but, and he had this group of Al-Qaeda, they eventually threw him out, and then he ended up in Afghanistan under kind of the protection of a group that had come in there, which was the Taliban. Um, so, this was kind of the situation that developed here as well. Because of the fact that Afghanistan was seen as the definitely at fault because of the fact that um, they had allowed Osama bin Laden and Al-Qaeda to be there and orchestrate these attacks. Bush will order a massive campaign against Afghanistan. The Taliban will be overthrown relatively quickly, uh, but Osama bin Laden will be on the run uh, for quite some time. 
um, trying to evade the um, capture of the United States. The reality is, though, for as long as he's there, uh, there's going to be a lot of fear within the United States of future attacks and things like that. And here we see some of these uh, just s such sad images. And some more here. This is one plane already hit. This is the second plane coming in. And again, the destruction. So let's talk about some of the aftermath of 9-11. So economically, definitely is a, a negative economic impact. This has a lot to do with the fact that many Americans will cancel their travel plans. Nervous, basically, to fly. Nervous of what was to come up uh, after this. So this is going to be a big thing that's going to occur. The United States will pass a, an act which has been seen as pretty controversial since, but against the kind of paranoia of everything going on, they passed what's known as the Patriot Act in October of 2001. The Patriot Act allows for a pretty massive email and phone surveillance of people also, detention and deportation of immigrants accused of terrorism. Um, so much more surveillance allowed basically under this than ever before. And some have claimed this kind of a violation of civil rights, individual liberties. Others saying this is what we have to do in order to protect ourselves and make sure something like this does not happen again. The... Um, we'll also see the construction of a new department in the cabinet. This is the Department of Homeland Security. Um, I'll get a little bit more into what the Department of Homeland Security does, but basically protecting the nation borders and keeping attackers out. We're also going to see alleged terrorists and, and immigrants being held without habeas corpus or uh, really due process here. Uh, meaning that they are going to be held for significant long period of times. Um, this will see many that were suspected as being terrorists and suspected Al-Qaeda members being placed in uh, the Guantanamo Bay detention camp uh, in Cuba, where basically torture and other tactics went on in order to get information. Um, again, a lot of controversy here as to whether or not this should be allowed. Um, so really kind of a, a tough deal. U.S. unity, though, we will see become extremely strong following 9-11. The amount of people waving American flags, the ability for Democrats and Republicans kind of to, re, to unite um, around national security is going to be really significant and something important to look at here as well. Um. With that being said, though, a lot of fear as this really does show huge U.S. vulnerability um, as, you know, really up to this point, the United States did see themselves as being fine, being protected. There really hadn't been uh, too many attacks on U.S. soil. I mean, you got to think like Pearl Harbor. Um, that was kind of the big one. But other than that, you know, a lot of U.S., safety and whatever else and so that's going to kind of fizzle away out of this so um really kind of a sad reality but a true one at that okay a criticism by the way here of the patriot act and here by the way we see uh the department of homeland security border enforcement is big um immigration laws other things like that um before by the way 9 11 um when you went to the airport, it was largely done by a private security company. But it's after 9-11 that we see the creation of the TSA through the Department of Homeland Security and what we now associate with traveling by air, which are long lines, long security checks, other things like that. And that comes, again, directly out of this. The other semi-result that's going to happen out of 9-11 is going to be the war against Iraq, and this one is still pretty controversial to this day, and you know, when we talk about history and uh, kind of waiting some time to really assess the effects and whatever else, this would be somewhat an example of that. So anyways, um, Iraq, since the um, first Gulf War, uh, Saddam had remained in power, but one of the conditions was that uh, they had to agree to UN um, weapon inspections to make sure they were not creating um, nuclear weapons or anything like that. Well, 
Saddam had repeatedly refused UN inspectors, uh, refusing to allow them to come in. A lot of kind of suspicion that maybe Saddam wasn't actually playing by the rules. Um, against the context of kind of 9-11 and this continued idea that there would be another terrorist attack or maybe multiple, Bush decided to put his focus on Iraq specifically and saw it as a threat to the United States. Uh, claimed that Iraq was an access of evil, said that it very much jeopardized American security. Um, so this is kind of interesting. And the reality is there were other countries at the time that were violating um, nuclear weapon type inspections country, and that were known to be creating them, countries like Iran and North Korea, for example. Uh, but Saddam and Iraq became the focus. Um, Saddam was no saint by his own right, and I say that again kind of like jokingly, but very oppressive ruler. Um, he, aside from just not allowing weapons inspections, killing his own citizens that disagreed with them, um, and the idea that he was supporting terrorist organizations in Iraq, all bad stuff. Um, again, because of um, kind of the backdrop of 9-11 and all the rest of this type of stuff going on there, big concern in the United States about, you know, kind of what might happen here um, if this was true. Um, and the big kind of icing on the cake was when the Bush administration announced that Saddam had weapons of mass destruction ready to go in Iraq. Um, and again, this really caused a lot of concern and a lot of fear uh, throughout the United States. So Bush pushed uh, Congress to get an official resolution to send armed forces to Iraq and congressional approval was granted. Um you know, it was pretty overwhelming, the vote to go to Iraq, but there was definitely quite a few people that did not agree, and that was very clear uh, from the onset. But most people, um, against the backdrop of 9-11, against this fear of terrorist threat, did feel like this was the good idea and the right thing to kind of do. Early on, the U.S. has great success in their initial invasion of Iraq. Uh, they come in, Saddam flees from power, um, as this, as this uh, image shows, they took down the, the uh, statue of Saddam pretty quickly. A lot of excitement, it seemed like, from the Iraqi people. So much so that this seemed so successful that after less than a month, um, with Baghdad fallen and Saddam out of power, Bush claimed mission accomplished in this kind of very much um, sort of like made fun of speech at this point uh, because that's not actually going to be what had happened. Uh, but basically, you know, saying, hey, look, we're done. Almost like first Gulf War is quick. You know, things are taken care of. But the aftermath of this initial invasion is not going to be exactly what Bush expected. And here he is making the mission accomplished speech. Um, you see the signs, you see um, the military men and women here, um, and he felt like this was all going to be good to go. That is not going to be the case, actually, at all, and what ends up happening is really problematic. So some really big troubles will occur in Iraq. After Saddam leaves, the amount of violence that erupts Iraq is going to be massive, and that's going to have a lot to do with the fact that the two major ethnic groups... Uh, Sunni and Shiite Muslims are going to be intensely fighting one another. Um, so that's going to be something that comes into play here that is really going to be a, a very tough situation. And this is going to mean huge U.S. troops in Iraq. The Sunni and Shiites in Iraq did not get along at all and, you know, disagreed, killed each other. But one thing they did agree with was that they did hate the United States. So both sides definitely trying to attack U.S. troops. And really tough situation for U.S. troops that had to, to stay in Iraq and try to kind of figure out how to provide some level of stability in the region, which would prove increasingly challenging and increasingly difficult. 
Added to this was the fact that terrorists from the general region are going to come into Iraq at this point. Um, it was Al-Qaeda originally. That had kind of been dismantled for the most part. But there's going to be kind of a new group that's going to be a much bigger Al-Qaeda that's going to come into Iraq and then other areas of uh, the Middle East. And this group is ISIS. And maybe you've heard of ISIS. ISIS at one point was very, very powerful. They've lost a lot of their um, initial successes. But really, the origination of ISIS largely comes out of U.S. troops, U.S. occupation in Iraq. So really not a good situation. Um, they try to have elections, put democracy into the, into Iraq, been largely not very good, especially in this initial point in the middle 2000s, um, and the violence in the region just continuing to kind of epic levels. Um, here's kind of a look at Bush, um, and then this is Colin Powell. Colin Powell, um, really was pretty big on saying that, um, you know, this was a mistake and that he was very suspicious of this claim of weapons of mass destruction. Uh, this is Donald Rumsfeld, um, who was the, uh, secretary of defense, um, who, you know, was big at initiating the war. And then here we have Dick Cheney. Before things got really ugly with Iraq, uh, the election of 2004 did come up. Um, at that point, Iraq was seemingly a little more complicated than many had anticipated, but it hadn't quite developed into the uh, kind of nightmare it would later become. Um, so it, that's what we're looking at. So first off, early 2000s, big divide uh, between the American people. And a lot of that had to do with kind of, um, you know, the social stuff in regards to civil liberties because of the Patriot Act, uh, definitely in regards to uh, tension with big business, um, cultural tensions over uh, right to marry for gay and lesbian couples as by 2004 some um, cities and states had determined that that was legal, federal government still had not. So a lot of kind of back and forth and a lot of divisiveness on a whole lot of fronts. And obviously the other dividing issue would certainly be um, the Iraq war as a whole. So in 2004, campaign is going to take place. Uh, Bush will run for re-election. He's going to praise himself on the tax cuts that initially had led to some economic growth. Um, the other thing on the campaign trail, he's going to be really proud of is going to be an initiative known as No Child Left Behind. This was essentially setting up sanctions against schools that failed to meet performance standards um, across the nation in order to try to increase educational um, standards across the country. Um, and he also, um, other than tax cuts, he also played himself as being a good wartime leader, said, hey, look, you know, we're going to need my leadership, that continuity in order to be successful. Democrats are going to put up John Kerry. Um, John Kerry was actually a Vietnam veteran. However, when he came back from the war, he was anti-war and he had criticized Vietnam. And so for a lot of people kind of said, Ugh, you know, as we enter into this war, we might need somebody that's a little stronger, not somebody that was anti-war like Kerry. And so Bush will achieve victory again in 2004. This time, once again, a close election. Not as close as 2000, uh, but still pretty tight. So Bush, you know, does serve two terms. But if you really think about his um, elections, both of them are among the closest in American history. And here's Bush, by the way, in 2004 on the campaign trail, um, his wife, his two daughters, and then Dick Cheney. And here you can see, you know, again, very tight, 286 to 251. And, um, you know, again, you're talking, actually, this, this one in 2004 came down to the state of Ohio with 20 electoral college votes. Um, if Kerry had achieved that, he would have won the election, but Bush is able to win it. No recounts, nothing like that in this one. It's, it's, it's definitely a victory for Bush. It's just close. All right, let's talk about Bush's second term, which doesn't really go as well as his first term. Again, not that like his first term went great, but he did enough to at least get reelected. 
Um, he'll be able to get two new Supreme Court justices on the bench, both relatively conservative, so able to push uh, that agenda in the Supreme Court. Um, he's going to put up a plan to try to privatize Social Security. This will fail, and this has a lot to do with the fact that people liked Social Security, and you know they didn't want that to be privatized. Um, same thing when he tried to place a ban on same-sex sex marriage. Uh, there were enough people that support were supportive of it that that was not really a plan that worked out relatively well. Controversy will fall on Dick Cheney. Um, his chief of staff will be connected to perjury charges and will have to be dismissed. And then a lot of controversy over illegal wiretap surveillance in violation going beyond uh, Patriot Act and things like that. So just a messy situation. Think about Dick Cheney. Think about a guy that really was kind of behind the scenes and really kind of secretive, uh, but really had enormous power, enormous influence and things like that. Another tragedy that's going to happen during Bush's presidency is going to be the massive hurricane that will hit in Hurricane Katrina um, to New Orleans. Uh, this will be the most devastating hurricane. Um, you can see here the image, by the way, New Orleans basically underwater. And, you know, you can't blame, obviously, Bush for a hurricane. But what did get the blame was Bush's very weak response um, he didn't really address it too much until after about a week when the hurricane had already hit. Um, not enough funding uh, given from FEMA and other things like that. So the recovery from Katrina was hard. It was tough and really did not work out uh, very well. All these kind of situations, and again, Iraq war also not going very well are going to lead to Democrat control of Congress in 2006. Um, and again, I think a lot of that showed the dissatisfaction of Americans, the kind of feeling that maybe they made a mistake in 2004 with the election of Bush for the second term. Um, a lot of this also hitting with the fact that um, Iraq had really kind of become a, a, a bad problem. The other thing about it was that there seemed to be no end in sight. Um, also, in the later part of Bush's presidency in the second term, those tax cuts, we will see their effects in that it will lead to major economic problems, a pretty big uh, deficit, um, and some other things are going to come into play that are really going to be problematic. So when we think about Bush, um, those situations have largely hit on um, what people kind of remember about Bush and leading to a lot of unpopularity for him. So um, usually is remembered as not being very um, good. And a lot of that has to do with what happens in a second term, which is just kind of a whole bunch of problems. Um, here, by the way, is another look at Hurricane Katrina. Um, again, this was a street or the, this is a, this is a street. You see the cars, they literally engulfed underwater. Um, this is Bush looking over Katrina. Um, again, has been still, you know, largely criticized for his relatively weak, meager response. Um, and then here we see approval. And you see Bush's approval hits very, very high. And that has a lot to do with 9-11 and his response out of 9-11 and what he was seen as being really, really strong. And you can see even up to about 2004, still hovering above 50%. Um, so that's really, really good. And then you can see what happens in the second term by the time he leaves office. Approval only around the 30%, not exactly a good way or in a good spot to be at. Okay, so let's talk about the election of 2008 then, kind of remembering all these things going on. This is going to be the first open election in a long time. And what I mean by that is this is the kind of the first election where we didn't actually have a vice president running or something like that. So to look back at that, you really have to look back at election of um, or, or, or an incumbent, excuse me. And that would be um, really going back to kind of like 1968 with the election of um, Nixon, because all the other ones at least had, you know, an incumbent or a um, vice president. That was the big kind of trend. So this is not going to happen, and this time we're finally going to see kind of an open field. 
So the Democrats, uh, a lot of people are going to be running for election in 2008, vying for the Democrat can uh, nomination. And that's going to have a lot to do with the fact that they kind of knew that they would win because of Bush's unpopularity. So, you know, that was a big deal. Also, Democrats eager, you know, eight years sitting on the sidelines, wanting to get in here, wanting to be involved. So the two front runners will be Barack Obama from Illinois and then Hillary Clinton from um, the former vice president who had then been a senator from New York. And uh, both would have been historic candidates as Barack Obama's obviously African-American and then Hillary Clinton woman. Um, but Obama will do enough to secure the nomination in 2008 and be the Democratic candidate. Um, he will pick Joe Biden as his vice president, somebody that had a lot of political experience. So one of the criticisms of Obama was that he didn't have a ton of political experience, was kind of young. So he says, hey, look, look at my vice president, Joe Biden, a lot of experience, things like that. It's nice. Um, his big deal is going to be kind of the end of partisanship. And he's going to say, listen, the Bush years were plagued by this horrible bipartisanship and no one getting along. He says, you can't do that anymore. And so let's push, you know, a very much bipartisan good agenda. Let's work together and let's end some of this divisiveness from the Bush years. The Republicans are going to put up John McCain, a very distinguished um, politician in his own right, a Vietnam War vet that actually suffered years of torture as a pri prisoner of war, so by all intents and purposes, an American hero. Um, funny about McCain, he actually was known for being a pretty bipartisan politician, although a Republican. Um, he had supported bipartisan legislation on immigration reform, campaign finance, and even coined himself as being the maverick. Uh, you know, it's kind of, I, I always find that kind of funny. He's going to decide to pick a woman by the name of Sarah Palin as the governor. When people picked her, people were saying, who is this lady? She's actually the governor of Alaska. And at the beginning, it was kind of a lot of excitement. But over time, interviews kind of showed that she wasn't really strong on the issues and really was probably more of a liability than an asset for the campaign, not exactly very good. So what we're going to see is on the campaign trail, Obama will amass a huge campaign war chest. And kind of different than a lot of uh, other candidates of the past, which is that a lot of this is from basically small donations from a lot of volunteers. So typically a lot of times when people are financing a campaign which costs millions of dollars um they try to go for big donors and get a few big donors to really support them obama obviously has some of those but he's gonna get a lot of people that are going to be donating like five dollars ten dollars to the campaign he's gonna have a big website uh phone calling door-to-door -door volunteers helping out a lot of enthusiasm basically for the obama campaign Obama will achieve victory in 2008. You can see here um, it's going to be pretty big victory, pretty clear mandate. And unfortunately for McCain, he was kind of destined to lose because a lot of his critics were just kind of coining him as being a, a Bush third-termer, which obviously nobody wanted because of Bush's kind of unpopularity. So Obama able to secure victory. Again, an incredibly historic election, Barack Obama becoming the first African-American president um, in U.S. history. Really, really big deal um, and something that obviously, you know, very kind of excited and proud of considering the just horrible history uh, for African-Americans in the United States. And here, by the way, we see the, the two uh, sides. We see Palin with McCain and then Obama with Biden. Okay, so let's talk about the Obama White House. What are some of the things that are going on? Uh, well, again, huge enthusiasm when Obama takes over, but Obama inherits quite a big amount of issues. The war obviously still going on, no end in sight, and then big economic issues. Um, when Obama took over, the economy had really gotten so bad. Unemployment had risen to huge levels. Um, companies were declaring bankruptcy and basically saying they didn't think they would ever be able to operate again. 
The solution that Obama proposes is semi-New Dealish in that it is going to be a massive stimulus bill to totally assist the economy. This bill, known as the American Relief and Recovery Act, trillions and trillions of dollars um, worth of tax cuts in order to try to get things moving, um, new spending for key jobs, infrastructure projects, relief to state and local government. Also really interesting about this, not only does he do those things as far as jobs and spending and infrastructure, whatever else, but he also gives a bailout to some big companies, and these included big automakers, bankers, um, and insurance companies that were given huge amounts of money from the from the government. And some criticism in 2008 when this happens, like, how can you do this? Uh, but this will start to lead to help um, in that the economy will have some recovery um, won't be huge necessarily, but enough to kind of get the ball rolling and at least get out of the worst of the recession, which was really kind of 2008, early 2009. The other big thing that Obama is going to try to address, and also I should have said this, Obama, at least in 2008, 2000 to 2010, both houses of Congress are going to be Democrats. So that's going to largely allow him to be able to push his agenda um, with their support, and he decides to really pick up on health care. If you remember, Hillary Clinton tried to do health care um, in 93, big failure, but he's, but those, a lot of those problems still lingered around. So what Obama comes up with is known as the Affordable um, Care Act, what many have called Obamacare, uh, kind of uh, sometimes in criticism, sometimes in seriousness, and what the Affordable Care Act does uh, did and still does is basically makes healthcare much more accessible. Um, it also, by the way, made healthcare a requirement for all Americans that they had to have. But in order to do that, obviously, it meant that basically you had to get rid of um, this thing that a lot of insurance companies were doing, which was not providing coverage with people for with pre-existing conditions, and also allowing people to buy healthcare. Um, over like a, a market, basically, as opposed to just only being able to buy through their jobs because, unfortunately, a lot of people not having that ability and not having that opportunity. We're also going to see um, Wall, Wall Street reform occur, uh, consumer protection as well, in order to try to put some, you know, regulatory system over this and uh, again, because of the 2008 recession, trying to put some protections and trying to make it kind of work a little bit better. Okay, so more things happening over Obama. Um, by 2010, many believe that a lot of the policies were too liberal for the U.S. people. And a group of ultra conservatives are going to start this movement known as the Tea Party Movement. Um, angry, they're going to have marches, again, known as the Tea Party because of their association with that from the past. And they're going to do enough, basically, to be able to woo over even kind of moderate Republicans. And in 2010, um, those congressional victories that Obama was lucky to have, or those uh, congressional Democrat majorities are going to go away, and huge Republican victories in 2010. Uh, so kind of showing that even though progress had been made, um, many people thought a lot of the policies were just too much, too much spending, not enough there. So kind of an interesting sentiment uh, that we see there. Obama will focus his attention on the war and try to get basically troops out of Iraq and out of Afghanistan. Um, he'll be more successful with Iraq, but he will be able to get quite a few troops out of Afghanistan, kind of minimize the commitment there. And a great victory that happens for Obama in uh, at the end of his first term is finally, basically after 10 years on the run, Osama bin Laden is found and killed. Um, so kind of a big triumphant moment. They had been tracking him, but he had really been living very secretively and very hard to find. So it was really impressive that they were able to do this. Uh, that being said, still tensions, still issues. Um, and although Obama able to win in 2012 for a second term, you can see here a closer victory than what we saw in 2016. 
um, as Obama beats uh, the Republican challenger Mitt Romney. Okay, so just a couple things about Obama's second term. And again, we go through. I go through this kind of quickly because it's so recent, it's really hard to totally judge, but there's some significant things that will happen in the second term. Climate change initiatives will definitely become a priority for Obama. Um, the Affordable Care Act, although it passes in the first term, is complicated to kind of implement and put together. So he's going to kind of continue to implement that, continue to make that accessible, uh, continue to work with the states in order to put that together so it really becomes um, an actual reality versus just something that was passed. He's going to move more troops out of Iraq um, and basically get them, for the most part, out. Um, get some troops out of Afghanistan, but the situation there, a little more complicated, so that would be a tough situation in that regard. Um, something Obama does, which is pretty interesting as far as foreign relations are concerned, is he tries to thaw out a little bit of the tension with Cuba. Fidel Castro still alive at this point, but was no longer the head of Cuba, even though kind of running things from behind the scenes. But Obama tried to basically say, hey, look, this embargo is hurting Cuba. Um, the Cold War is over. Um, you know, we need to maybe have a little bit of better relations. And so even to the point where domestic flights will be allowed between the United States and Cuba, um, a, a laxing of the embargo, other things like that. But most of those things have kind of gone away uh, through the Trump administration. Another big um, and significant moment is that it will be by the end of Obama's second term in about 2015 where same-sex marriage will be officially illegal in the entire country. There were some state challenges, and those were put to bed, and this all works out and is all good to go. So this is a significant moment as well. And here we see um, Obama taking the um, inauguration for a second term. Okay, so to today, what's happened? Well, Trump won in 2016. Um He's a unique victor in the sense that he really had zero political experience and zero military experience, really the only president that the, that both of those conditions have. Um, he's actually one of only a couple that didn't have any previous political experience, uh, but able to win off, you know, kind of big campaigning um, and also, to be quite frank, the unpopularity of his opponent, Hillary Clinton, which... Uh, people were not necessarily super excited about. At the beginning part of Trump's um, presidency, definitely some good economic growth for the country, um, but a lot of that, w very conservative politics, um, and we've seen a lot of the kind of more liberal policies from the Obama era largely kind of gone away or at least challenged. He's definitely been enwrapped in some scandals, including Russian interference in the election, but then his involvement with that kind of went away. Uh, but then he had the scandal with um, Stormy Daniels and a lot of other things going on and happening there. I call a lot of what Trump does uh, Twitter diplomacy because um, he's relatively unique in the sense that he seems to vent out and share a lot of his ideas through Twitter. So I find that kind of interesting and kind of different, but nonetheless, that is something that he is big on. Um, obviously, the big thing that we've seen recently is the COVID-19, which is pretty historic, this large-scale pandemic that has really um, Im impacted um, lots of lives lost, um, still, you know, things shut down, economic progress really hit hard. Um, and now we're seeing kind of a move to open things up, but still cases, still no vaccine, really interesting stuff. We've also seen uh, recently a lot of movement in the Black Lives Matter movement, which we definitely saw in the 2010-ish um, uh, times, and we saw it kind of peak up, but now uh, with the death of George Floyd definitely coming back in as they demand justice, as they demand police reform. And again, this is so recent, we don't exactly know what's going to happen as a result of that. But we've definitely seen mass protests, mass action, and mass feeling that this really is just unacceptable how um, especially black men are being treated by police and law enforcement and there needs to be reform in order to kind of limit that. Um, always when we finish out, we always like to think of this, how will we remember this period? You know, how are we going to look at this how are we going to remember this? You know, what are we going to say? How is this going to look? You know, that kind of stuff. 
and I think that's always interesting to look at there. Um, anyways, thanks a lot. That kind of takes us to the end. A lot of stuff going on here, but, you know, again, it's so much of this is so recent, it's really hard to tell exactly what's its place in history, but definitely something. Take care.